Hi everyone, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Jones with Scott Laboratories, uh, here to talk about healthy fermentation. Uh, I guess Michael and I have been corresponding for about six months or so now and finally got to meet at Unified a few weeks ago, but uh, looking forward to the class. Um, we are going to be recording our sessions here um, and posting them on the membership area of the TFWA, um, so on TennesseeWines.com. So for those members of the association, you can log in uh, with your password and you'll have access to all this stuff later on. Uh, all the presentations this, this week weekend will be doing that. So, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, there is no PowerPoint. So uh, if anything isn't clear, <laughs> If you have any questions, interrupt, break in, whoa, ask away. Uh, the, uh, the reason Adam invited me here is because I'm sort of a generalist. I've been, uh, I've been working in a winery since 1971 and been making my own wine since 1974. What is that, 20 years ago? Something like that. The, well, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the problems that I have is I'm a little uh, tempo, temporal, temporally, whatever it is, I'm challenged when it comes to time. I'm always off by increments of 10 years. And uh, so you have to excuse me, if I'm talking about vintages with you, I'm probably always going to get it wrong, but, I'll, but you can figure it out because it's always, I'm off by 10 years or 20 years. Um, if you, like I say, if you have any questions, and even if you want to go off on any tangents, that's fine with me. Because the bulk of what I have to tell you, the important stuff is on this, my outline. And um, one of the reasons is that I'm pretty much concentrating on the very, uh, my first talk here on yeast because it's. The, the, let's say the vineyard owner has already done all of the work. Grapes cannot be changed now. It's going to be up to the winemaker to uh, take those grapes and not screw them up. And so basically, it's, it's sort of a uh, kind of continuation of what the, wine, of what the vineyard does. But in uh, a winemaker, what you're doing is, in essence, you're farming yeast. You want to make sure that the yeasts are happy. It's, I would say, it's even more rigorous form of farming than, than growing a vineyard, because in a vineyard, a modicum of stress is said to be good for the vines, or good for the quality of the fruit. If you have an extraordinarily happy vines growing all over the place, there's a good chance that your fruit is not going to be extraordinary. You want you uh, and they they play with things in the vineyard like uh, uh, a deficit irrigation, where you withhold water at certain points or from certain parts of the vine. The idea being you're going to stress just enough that it's going to start to develop a little more flavor, a little more character. Yeast, on the other hand, yeast is just the opposite. Yeast does not like stress. Uh, if you stress yeast too much, it will start to, you might not even notice it at first, but the first thing that it will start to do, it will start to pull back. Start. You might have a nice clean fermentation, but the flavors just aren't going to be there because the yeast does a lot to develop flavor in your wine. Pull a little bit more stress on the yeast, then you start, might start getting some off flavors. Maybe a little bit of hydrogen sulfide, a little bit of rotten egg in some cases, if the stress is of a certain type. Maybe a little bit of acetic acid, which is vinegar. Uh, the yeast can make all of these under stressful conditions. Pull back a little bit more, you stress in the vine a little bit more, not paying good attention to it. And then you might start getting a sluggish fermentation. And then if you stress it too much, your wine, your wine is just going to stop fermenting. And it happens to the best winemakers, one of the finest winemakers I know in the Central Coast in California. He had a call from him a few years back, and he has this uh, about two tons of Syrah, an open-top 
uh, fermenter, and he let it get up to 95 degrees. He killed his yeast uh, by bricks. I mean, that took a lot of skill. Uh, I have, you know, I'm used to people, you know, stressing out their yeast and managing to kill them off, you know, maybe about one, two percent sugar, but they do it at five. Yeah, that's, that's really top notch. Yeah, so one of the things about this is I have here the primary challenges. Now, these are all things that you can alter to some extent or another. You cannot eliminate all of the stresses on the yeast when you're making your wine. What you want to do is the ones that are inevitable, you try to minimize them or minimize the impact. The ones, there are ones that you can control, such as the temperature of fermentation, you can control that. Uh, and so, in essence, well, if you have, let's say, one stress on the yeast, that's fine. Two stresses, it's not like you have double the stress, it's more like you have now have about five, six times the stress. It's, it's multiplicative, it is not additive. So, when you start to get up around three or four stresses on the wine and on that yeast, and then you have a very good chance of just killing them off. So, hopefully what's in this will help you avoid that. And the first and most important one here, nutrition. Nutrition, yeah, it's, I'm just curious, how many people here use DAP? Yeah. Okay, DAP has been the traditional nutrient that's been used for ages. It's cheap, but it only gives you one thing. And that is nitrogen. And people think that because we, you know, when you're testing for your nutrient status in your wine, you're testing your yams, yeast available nitrogen. Therefore, nitrogen is the most important thing, right? That in itself is, uh, you know, not necessarily true. If you go to Europe, they think oxygen is the most important nutrient. But the nitrogen level, when you measure your nitrogen, that doesn't tell you that if you correct nitrogen, everything will be fine. No, it's an indicator that your nutrient level is low. There are also, you have vitamins, minerals, cofactors, other macronutrients, all of these are vital for the yeast. It's just that we cannot test for all of them. A friend of mine is the microbiologist at ETS Labs in St. Helena. And I asked him once, what, is there an all-encompassing test? And he said, no. It's like, now you could develop different tests for doing all of these things, but Probably to do all of the tests for a winery, it would take you three months and cost about $30,000. And there's very few people that are willing to do that. And by the time the testing is over, because for some tests you need incubation periods, by the time you've got all of the results, it would all really be too many more. So we use testing for nitrogen as sort of an indication that the nitrogen is really low, there's a good chance that a lot of other nutrients both macro and micro are also low. If you are correcting only the nitrogen, that means all of these other nutrients that might be low, they're still going to remain low. Uh, this is where I get a little bit on my soapbox here because we're using, I mean, data has always been the cheapest way to correct your nitrogen. But the most effective way to correct your nutrient status is, is a yeast-based uh, nutrient. I'm not going to give you any names because you see them all around. There's ones that are just purely organic nitrogen. There are ones where they, you might have a yeast-based uh, nutrient with added minerals, with added vitamins, things like this. But what yeast is, yeast a dead yeast cell, if you break that down, will have all of the nutrients that a new yeast cell needs to live. <coughs> when you get a complete nutrient based on inactivated yeast, you're getting something that has all of those micronutrients, all of the minerals, all the cofactors that your new yeast needs to live and ferment. I equate it with uh, uh, my gardening when 
do do do. Any of you have like grow vegetable gardens? Anything like that? Yeah, I used to do that. Actually, when I was living in France, I did a vegetable garden for a woman there, and it's really opened my eyes because in Europe they've been growing things in the soil for so long that there is nothing left. That soil is really poor. And so I'm digging in her backyard and I, I'm turning the soil over and I'm getting, getting rid of all the weeds. I plant tomatoes, the tomatoes grow up. And, you know, every time they start, they start to turn a little bit yellow, she sprays a foliar nut nitrogen spray on it. All that's doing is making the leaves look really green. It's doing nothing for the fruit of the tomato plant itself. The first tomato turns red, and we cut it open, and took a bite, and it was sort of like textured water. There was nothing. That's because all we did was fix that one nutrient, and it was just, and it was primarily for the visuals. So what I did is I dug a trench, serpentine around all the tomato plants, filled it with compost, and then for the next two weeks, we went through the compost, and guess what? Tomatoes then had flavor. This is the difference between using that and using a complete nutrient. You're with a complete nutrient based on inactivated yeast cells. You are giving everything the yeast needs to survive. With that, you're only giving one thing. Now, there are times, for instance, if you're really, really low. If your nutrient status is very, very low, which happens a lot with also with certain fruit. Uh, like for instance, apples, I do cider. And uh, I've never had a yam. Now see, quite often you're up in, uh, like with grapes. You may, I've picked grapes that have had yams, 400 parts per million. On the other hand, I've never had a cider that was higher than 80 parts per million. I'm going to pick the apples. And that means a lot of it. So, uh, and if it's very, very low, sometimes I will use an inactivated yeast nutrient, and I might tweak it at the end with a little bit of that, but it's just a very, very little bit. That's typically how huh? we use it, it's just as a supplement to the, yeah. to the nutrient. And even then, there's a, there's some new things. I, I, and I, I'm not going to go over everything here because it's there, you can read it. But uh, <clears throat> the difference between organic and inorganic nitrogen. Okay, organic nitrogen is what you're going to get from the yeast <coughs> itself. You also get a little bit of inorganic nitrogen, but it's mostly organic. It's based on amino acids. Uh, the inorganic nitrogen part of the grapes, and also what's what that is, is ammonia-based nitrogen. Now. Ammonia-based nitrogen will be taken up much faster by the yeast. It's like candy for a kid. You know, you put your peas in front of a kid and you give them a bowl of candy. What is the kid going to have first? He's going to eat the candy. And the same thing with yeast. You put, if they're given the option, give them both the organic and inorganic nitrogen. Go straight for the inorganic. Now, you know, without any added ammonia nitrogen, if you look at the way the, the nitrogen levels go down, the or inorganic nitrogen just goes and it's gone. The organic nitrogen goes down much slower, and then usually about two thirds of the way through the fermentation starts to go up again as yeast cells start to break down as they get older and release more nitrogen into the wine. Uh, that inorganic nitrogen the main thing it will do will help build up a large population at the very beginning. That's not necessarily good. Because let's say you have a nutrient deficiency, and then early on in fermentation you add that. You create an enormous biomass that then depletes all of the nutrients, not only the nitrogen, but the micronutrients too. And, oh, God, it was two years ago, especially a bad year for that, I had about a half dozen people call me saying that they had, they were, you know, about a third of the way through the fermentation, the fermentation started getting stinky, which is really odd. That's not normal. 
And uh, unless you have a lot of really nasty, unless you have nasty grapes, if the grapes didn't look nasty, they, they were not full of mold, anything like that. And I said, did you add DAP? And you know, no, it's right at the beginning, just pump it full of DAP. Sure enough, he built up a large biomass, completely depleted all those micronutrients, and that put the extra stress on the yeast, and it just started going really sick. He started getting hydrogen sulfide a third of the way through the fermentation. So, <clears throat> uh, I've gotten to the point now where I actually, uh, even on my cider, I don't use any DAP at all. And part of this is some of the new stuff we've learned recently. One is inorganic nitrogen is only about a quarter to a fifth as effective as organic nitrogen. So if let's say you need to, you figure out according to the, you know, the recipe here that you need to add 100 parts per million nitrogen. That's based generally on inorganic nitrogen. If you need to add 100 parts per million of inorganic nitrogen, you only need to add 20 to 25 parts per million organic nitrogen to accomplish the same thing. In addition, the uh, amino acids, they are precursors to aromatic compounds. If you only do your corrections with that, that's not gonna do anything for the aromatics. But if you're using an organic source or a source of organic nitrogen, that's going to give you precursors for ar more aromatic elements. And uh, so you're actually going to increase your aromatic potential by using organic, uh, let's say, yeast-based complete nutrients. And uh, now I've gotten to the point, as I mentioned, that with my cider, uh, I don't, I might do an addition at the beginning, when, well, I always do an addition right at the beginning, but for my second fermentation, um, I don't really need to add any more nitrogen because first of all, at the end of the first fermentation, see, I do a bottle conditioning. And so a little bit of yeast goes into my bottle along with a little bit of sugar. I cap it, and I don't even need to add any more nitrogen at that point because the yeast is left about usually on the average 25 parts per million organic nitrogen in my base cider, which is the equivalent of 100 parts per million inorganic nitrogen, which is the recommended amount to go into bottle conditioning. So anyway, there's a down here at the bottom, there's a little uh, blurb on how to, how to figure out your nitrogen addition. And that is clear also on the very back page. There's a more recent one that our microbiologist made up, so I decided to copy that and add that to this too. And if you ever have any questions, give me a call, email me. It's like, I love to talk about these things. I'll talk incessantly. You may never get off the phone. Your number here is somewhere? I'll give you my number. Uh, my number is 707 738 2401. Yeah, please. Huh? Again, please. 707 738 2401. Or if you prefer email, it's Michael J at Scott Lab, singular, S C O T T L A B. Dot com. If you make it plural, you'll get some big mega drug company in the East Coast. Two T? Who? You have two T's, yes. Okay. So, nutrition. That's probably the most important thing for your yeast. Uh, go to the second page. Who says sterols, fatty acids? Sterols and fatty acids, these are survival factors. And one of the big problems, especially if your alcohols are starting to move out there and <coughs> your fermentations are lasting longer, as the yeast ferments, it starts to bud and gives off a daughter cell. Now, a daughter cell then, now, the survival factors, which are called sterols and fatty acids, they help maintain the fluidity of the cell. So it can, you can have the passage 
of nutrients, of sugars, everything through that cell membrane. Anyway, every time it buds like that, each of those cells now has half the number of survival factors. If you have a very long fermentation, let's say created by high sugar and therefore resulting in high alcohol, what's going to happen is you're going to get to the point where those is budded enough times, there's no more, there's no more survival factors. And what happens when those survival factors go down and they don't, you don't have enough to sustain the yeast cell, the membrane that allows for the passage of nutrients, everything through there, and also it allows the cell to expel poison, it becomes sort of calcified, it becomes, it's no longer fluid, no longer malleable, and it can no longer expel the, the alcohol. Now, it doesn't die from alcohol poisoning, just like we don't die from alcohol poisoning. They probably have fun in their final minutes. But what happens is that they get alcohol poisoning, and they cannot keep the acid from the wine from out, and so the acid gets in, and they actually die from high acid. So, the... Um, you know, it's a horrible way to go. I'd rather die from alcohol. So, uh, anyway, sterols and fatty acids, the way you deal with that is at the beginning of the, first of all, when you are first rehydrating your yeast, use a rehydration nutrient. And the rehydration nutrients are very high in sterols and fatty acids. Once again, they are derived from inactivated yeast. But, yeast are chosen that are particularly high in sterols and fatty acids. And when the, you're in your rehydration water, the yeast literally is absorbing, taking up, before the fact, is taking up the, fat, the survival factors it needs for the end of the fermentation. Then the other things, if you, know, you know how you're supposed to pump over your wine? Let's say you're making a red wine, you're pumping over, you're aerating the wine when it's young. That aeration causes the yeast itself to create more sterols and fatty acids. So the combination of the aeration during the growth stage to the beginning and the use of a rehydration nutrient, those two things will front load your wine with the survival factors and especially high alcohol fermentations allow it to survive to the end. Um, actually, Usually I started using uh, these, the rehydration nutrients probably about 16 years ago, 17 years, 17 years ago. And I started using this on my own wine. And what I noticed, it used to be that I would get to the end of the fermentation, I'd press out my red wines, it would go in the barrel, and it would struggle to finish that last half a percent of sugar, sometimes for as much as three or four weeks. And since I started using a protocol where I'm starting, I'm doing more punch, uh, pump overs or punch downs, and I'm using rehydration nutrient at the beginning, my yeast goes straight to the wall. And generally, from five to seven days after I start my fermentation, I am bone, bone dry. Makes me very happy. Um, okay, down to competition. Uh, this is something actually that is a, a big problem in, in areas where you have uh, very wet conditions, where you might have botrytis in the vineyards. Uh, the problem never happens here, does it? <laughs> you never get rain in the winter. I mean, in the summer, growing season. You want some? I think it was 2013 when I first came into Tennessee and was visiting wineries. And I remember that was the year that I remember at the time that I was coming through, there had been 28 day, days straight of rain. And in North Carolina, they were uh, uh, they were on green pre Verasian grapes. They were having botrytis, visible botrytis, which the textbooks in California say doesn't happen. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Childress Winery over there. Mark, who, Mark Frislowski, who's the winemaker, uh, we were talking to his yet this year. 
We're not picking by flavor. We're not picking by numbers. We're picking by percent mold. The, something that nobody's ever thought about in California. The, um, but what happens is all these things, botrytis, for instance, can destroy phenolics. So, I mean, if you don't make some corrective action, your tannins are going to be very low if you have a bad botrytis infection. Yet, uh, a lot of your nutrients can be eaten up with the microbes. Uh, how many of you do cold soak uh, with your red wines? Yeah. Okay, this is where you basically crush your grapes and then you let them sit without fermentation for, you know, well, it depends. It might be hours to it might be, I'd say the average in Napa is probably about three or four days. Um, guess what? If you have a large microbial infection in there, in three hours, 85% of thiamine, one of your most vital nutrients, is depleted. It's gone. Uh, a lot of uh, friends of mine that have had stuck fermentations, it's because of this very situation. They've done their testing of nutrients, but they do it before their cold soak. Then they cold soak their lines, and then they don't realize it, but most of their micronutrients have been depleted. They start the fermentation to get a stuck fermentation. So, as far as action, well, personally, I say avoid cold soap. I'm not a big fan, and I keep, I keep seeing so many times that where bad things are taken off during the cold soap. If you are doing a cold soap, there actually is a, a, a yeast uh, that uh, Lalmo isolated from wild fermentations. It's called Meshnikovia fruticola. And you need stuff. It doesn't ferment. And um, you put it into the cold soak, and it basically it controls sort of the microbial environment so the bad guys can't grow. It outcompetes the bad guys. And then after your cold soak, then you can add your regular yeast, and it will take off. There will be no competition between that and the meshnikovia. And it's interesting. The uh, uh, I have a lot of friends that that do cold soaks or in California, and this has saved them a lot of times because the uh, sometimes the microbial environment can be so competitive that, you know, by the time your Saccharomyces yeast, your, the yeast that you want to take off, by the time it's taken off, a lot of off flavors and characteristics have been created, so. You talk about cold, you're talking about crushing and then cold storing, right? Yeah. I'm talking about just freezing the whole fruit and then oh, okay. when you get ready for it, yeah. then crush. Okay, yeah, that, that's completely different. Yeah, yeah, what these guys are doing is like they're crushing their grapes yeah. and then they're letting it sit. And supposedly, they're supposed to be letting it sit below 50 degrees. Because below 50 degrees, the metabolism slows way, way down. But guess what? When you have a tank that's about 10 feet across and the cooling is on the outside, it may be 50 degrees around the perimeter, but the center is a churning microbial soup. And I have one friend, the very first year he ever made a commercial wine. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it ended up as a commercial wine. Mm -hmm. Because he had these two consultants from this big winery nearby and so he thought, well, they know what they're doing. And they came in, first of all, they told him to get the grapes up to 28 bricks, and by then his acid was shot to hell, his pH was through the ceiling. Then he brought the grapes in, and they crushed the grapes, and he, then the consultant said, do a cold soap. 24 hours later, I was passing through, and he said, hey, you want to take a look at my, uh, my juice, or my wine? We just started the fermentation. And I said, climbed up the ladder, lifted up the lid, and it was almost blown off the ladder by the amount of ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate makes acetic acid look like mother's milk. Ethyl acetate is, in minuscule quantities, will make your wine taste like vinegar. Ethyl acetate is, huh? Oh, man, nail polish remover. Uh, 
I said, you know, you might want to call, I said, to call your experts and just tell them that uh, you just check the line and it smells like nail polish remover and you know, just, just tell them that. And so we did. And then there was silence on the other end of the line. And I said, we'll be right down. And we tried dilution because they could say that you can you can't really get rid of this stuff unless you get to go through this expensive VA removal done with membranes. It's very expensive. Uh, but you can sometimes dilute it. We tried it with some good wine that he had, some Cabernet. It did a dilution of 10 parts good wine, and one part bad wine. And boy, you couldn't tell that any good wine was in there. It was still so strong. He ended up, he's a pilot. And he has a little landing strip in the middle of his vineyard. And he rented one of those trucks that used on construction sites, you know, filled with water and keep the dust down. He filled it with Cabernet. <laughs> and it was really neat because for about two years afterwards, he had a purple landing strip in the middle of his vineyard. <laughs> 1,500 gallons. I uh, know, what's that? Next one, osmotic shock. This is when your sugar is very high. Uh, do you all know how a membrane works? You have a membrane. On this side you have, let's say you have just water. On this side you have pure water, on this side you have sugar solution. The way a membrane works is, the water will start to go through the membrane toward the sugar solution, trying to dilute this to equalize the pressure on both sides. <clears throat> now what happens if you have really, really sweet uh, juice, it creates a real stress on the yeast. The yeast membrane inside the yeast is basically water. And outside is this very sweet sugar solution. So the water wants to leave across the cell membrane and the cells will actually shrink. It's one of the reasons why, uh, if you ever, you ever see ants when they attack honey, and they, they end up dying, it's because they're in the honey, and it's so sweet on the outside, and literally they, they implode. The, now, the yeast pretty much is strong enough to withstand it, but in, what you are doing is with this very sweet, Sweet juice, you're creating an extremely stressful situation for the yeast. It will be aggravated by other things such as alcohol and uh, maybe competition, and the yeast cell will actually shrink down. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, generally speaking, if you have very sweet juice, if you're making a, uh, a dessert wine, you should use a yeast that has a proven track record for being resistant to osmotic stress, uh, or if you have it by accident, you can do what uh, a lot of winemakers in California do. Just take your hose and start filling up your tank with water to dilute your juice. But then again, remember in California, they're, you know, for, God, nowadays, they're making wines where it's not unheard of to be at 15, 16% or more. My brother worked uh, for a winery a few years back, and a customer came by and wanted to buy two bottles of their most expensive Pinot Noir. A Pinot Noir can be a beautiful, delicate wine. And what he was doing is he didn't trust labels, and the label said 15.5% alcohol in this wine, which is sorry, really high for Pinot Noir. But he was taking, he was gonna have a tasting with his rich friends, and he was taking one of the two bottles from each winery he was getting wine from and taking one of the bottles up to ETS for them to run alcohols on. And found out the actual alcohol level on this wine he bought from my brother was 17.2. Pinot Noir, a very delicate, light wine, 17.2 alcohol. I can't drink those wines. One of the reasons why most of the wines I drink are from this side of the Rockies is because wines out here are generally are around 12% alcohol. They have good acid. I need that acid in my life. I need the bright flavors to come with it. Uh, and I've also found out, because I, uh, 
Like, for instance, I love Chambers. And uh, when I started going on the road for Scott Lass, one of the trips I was in Missouri came back with a mixed case of Chamberson and Norton. Went into my cellar, but my memory's getting worse. I forgot it was there. And these were all from the early 2000s. And I started drinking them the last couple months. They've aged beautifully. I mean, just gorgeous. They, the, the Norton has some of that very aggressive young fruit has calmed down, it's still very obviously Norton, and it is very rich and very smooth. The Chamberson is just absolutely lovely. So, why did I start going up on that tangent? Oh. If you uh, let me do it long enough, and I'm really gonna rag on California one, it's just because I don't like the, the, the tack they're taking now. To me, they're, they're very recipe driven, and yeah, there are exceptions, but also, High alcohol driven, and sort of there's no varietal differentiation. It's all sort of, uh, sort of jammy and plummy, but in a very generic way. And one thing I refuse to do when I come to leave California, I will not drink California wines. When I travel across country, I do not travel 2,000 or 3,000 miles to go into a restaurant and see a California wine list. I, for, uh, for instance, I think it's an insult to the local wine industry. And also, I can go down on the road and get that exact same wine for a lot less. So, ethanol, number five. This is toxic to cells. And this is something you can't control. I know that there are alcohol-free wines, which I think is a blasphemy, but the, uh, I've never understood that. Just like alcohol-free beers, what's the use? Uh, oh, and now, there's alcohol-free distillates. Have you heard about that? There's, I think it's one of the big, it might be Diageo. They're doing alcohol-free, like whiskey equivalents or gin equivalents, things like that. And it says, oh my God, that's really like the ultimate insult. The, uh, anyway, but ethanol does provide stress, a lot of stress for the yeast. Now, this is where you have to do your balancing act. For every stress that you cannot avoid, you have to minimize your other stresses. So the alcohol is going to continue going up, and it's going to provide more stress for the yeast. So you do this, you don't let the temperature get out of control. You make sure that it had sufficient nutrients to start with. You make sure that um, you know, various elements in the wine that will cause stress on the yeast, they're minimized because you cannot minimize the alcohol. Uh, temperature. Above 90 degrees, you put a stress on your yeast. <clears throat> a lot of people like to get up there, but... Uh, and yeast can take it. If you have a strong yeast, and if other things such as your alcohol has been kept pretty low. But, as I said, this one friend of mine, he managed his went out of control, got to 95 degrees, completely killed off his fermentation. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is also very, very cold conditions can also stress out the yeast. There's this idea that the colder your white wine fermentation, the more aromatic your white wine is going to be. And because you have more esters. Well, this isn't necessarily true. Uh, first of all, if you put enough stress on that yeast, yeast is going to pull back from creating aromas. The other thing, too, is it's not that you're going to get more aromas, they're going to be different. Esters created at very low temperatures tend to be more in the banana uh, tropical realm. And as the temperature goes up, once you get up to like in the 60s and 70s, the esters are more in the realm of flowery. And then right in the middle, it tends to get a combination of both. Uh, so, I'm, I always sort of cringe a little when I have people say, oh yes, I try to ferment to the point where the yeast almost is not working at all. They, and they're trying to ferment at 45 degrees. Like, ah. But the other thing too is, your aromatics are going to be longer lived if you ferment at a higher temperature. Uh, 
but there was a very interesting paper a few years ago that uh, said where they compared white wines fermented at 18 degrees C versus 12 degrees C. And the ones at 18 degrees C, the aromatics were stronger and they lasted, you know, sometimes two to three times longer than the ones fermented at 12 degrees C. Uh, one winery that I know does a Sauvignon Blanc and they ferment up in the high 60s. It's a very nice Sauvignon Blanc and I have some, that sort of bucks the trend of the, you know, the really cold fermentation. They say, well, yeah, but their stuff goes into the market and will sit on the shelves and they have to make sure that after, before the next one is released in a year, that the stuff on the shelf still tastes good. You know, you don't want to have something on the shelf that just before it sells out, the bottle tastes like crap. You don't want that. You want your wine to taste as good in a year when somebody buys a bottle of it as it tastes when it's fresh. So they do that by fermenting at some slightly higher temperatures. Now you don't want to get carried away because if it gets too hot, you're going to blow off the aromatics just from the heat of the fermentation. Uh, number seven now, toxins. <coughs> Um, I have three things listed here. One is medium chain fatty acids. This is medium chain fatty acids. Uh, a lot of them are created by yeast itself. Uh, yeast under stressful conditions can create these. And I asked one of the professors at UC Davis why they did this, and what she said is they think it's a defensive reaction. A yeast is under stress, a yeast thinks it's about to die. And when, it, and when it's in this weakened condition, it knows it's going to be attacked by other microbes. So it puts out these medium chain fatty acids that are toxic as a means of killing off and we're dissuading these other microbes that might attack. The problem is, it, those medium chain fatty acids are also toxic for the yeast that puts them out, too. So whereas it might be fending off other attackers, it's also creating its own demise. So one, one of the things, if you ever have to restart a, firm, a stuck fermentation, one of the first things you do is you find with, uh, there are some things you can find, inactivated yeast, or yeast holes. Yeast has this wonderful ability to absorb a lot of different toxins, especially if they have sulfur compounds in them, and pull them out of the wine. And so if you've ever had a stuck fermentation and you look at your protocols from almost any producer or a supplier, they'll say the first thing you do is you find yeast holes or inactivated yeast to basically get rid of the toxins and then you start your uh, restart procedure. Um, volatile acidity. Once again, volatile acidity, well, that's your uh, acetic acid, your ethyl acetate. This not only can be you know, off flavors and off aromas, but you know, it's also, they're also very toxic to the yeast. You get above a certain level of either, for instance, uh, well, of ethyl acetate or acetic acid, and it can it can severely slow down, even kill the yeast. Actually, the same thing can happen with hydrogen sulfide. If you're stressing the yeast, and let's say a nutrient stress, it starts creating hydrogen sulfide, you get up to a certain level, and the hydrogen sulfide itself will kill the yeast. Um, if you can make it to the end, and with a very high volatile acidity, then you can always go to some type of VA removal, uh, which is, as I mentioned before, it's a membrane technology, it's expensive, and since you, I doubt if you have anybody with membrane technology in Tennessee, they probably come from, you doubt, from either New York or out from California, so you know, it's have to pay transportation costs, so uh, what started out as your $10 bottle of wine might end up as a $75 bottle of wine. That's okay. They, uh, who, who is it? VA, uh, I think it's VA removal systems. They, uh, they need money. <laughs> you know, 
One of the things about all of these systems for rectifying problems in wine, in some cases I think it's made for sloppy winemaking in California because if you do some, I mean, first of all, you're getting a lot more money for your wine. So you have a lot more expendable income. But at the same time, if something goes wrong, you get on the phone and somebody's there the next day with the means of fixing the wine. And so you have people doing a lot of weird things with so-called natural wine, with so-called, with weird ways of doing their fermentations and treating their wine, and they end up with some really nasty stuff going on, and they just call up, get on the phone, call up Wine Secrets, something like that, and they'll drive out there with their membrane technology, and look, look, they have the ability to literally take the wine apart, remove the part that they don't like, and then put it back together. They call it finding the sweet spot. So, but it makes it very easy to be sloppy. Okay, high SO2, the final one of the uh, toxins. Has anybody here ever missed your SO2 addition? Well, that's pretty good. This is the first group of winemakers I've ever been in, where there's been no one, everybody's been perfect. <laughs> Just about everybody I know has, at some point in their winemaking career, missed their SO2 addition by one decimal point. And uh, that, you, especially if you're doing a white wine, or well, actually even on red wine, it's really, the SO2 has a bleaching effect. Doing on red juice, it turns that juice really white and clear. Uh, this happened with uh, Davietsky. Uh, when he was helping me, go, it was back a number of years. I said, Dave, we need to add, I told him not to add SO2 to add, and he missed it by one decimal point. And I went over and it was, look, it was white, white juice, and I went over and looked at it, and this stuff looks awfully clear. And I worked up a beautiful yeast culture there. And you know when your yeast culture is good, it looks like a souffle? It was wonderful, it's bubbling away, and I added it. And if you can imagine the sound of five billion cells screaming in agony as they all die at the same time. And we had to go back out and actually pick about five times the original amount of Chardonnay that we had <coughs> diluted enough that we were able to get yeast started. So, adequate yeast population. This is one thing, don't skimp on your yeast. Generally speaking, for most wines, I'm looking at 25 grams per hectoliter, or that's 250 parts per million. That's what I'm looking to add when uh, I, uh, I'm adding yeast to my uh, juice. Uh, and that works for, if you're, if you're going to do a very high alcohol wine and your bricks is up there, Increase the amount of yeast you're doing. So you, as if you have a lot of other extraneous stresses, for instance, maybe a really bad botrytis uh, infection, you might want to increase your yeast then to accommodate the other stresses that you're fighting against. But don't try to save money by shortchanging it. And uh, there have been a lot of the big wineries try to do that because if they, if you're doing a million gallons. Uh, if you are if you are adding like 20% less yeast to every ferment, that's probably a million dollars that you've just saved. So, but there's a, a winery in, uh, in Lodi that gave me a call a few years back, and what they were doing, they're, they're, they pride themselves on very high alcohol fermentations. They uh, They'll, they'll start their fermentations at around 27 bricks. Now, 27 bricks, you should probably be up around 350 parts per million yeast, at least, to make up for the fact that if the bricks are so high and the alcohol is going to be so high. No. Instead of 250, which is the norm, and instead of going up, they went down to about 100 parts per million because they were going to save so much money. And not only did they get a number of quite a few numbers of uh, stuck fermentations, but they also end up with very high levels of acetic acid in them. 
And when I went out and talked to them, I also found out that the only nutrient they were giving them was that. So we switched them over to a complete nutrient and then got them to move uh, their population of yeast up to 250 parts per million and their problem with VA disappeared. Simple as that. A highly clarified must. This, when, if your juice, comes, now this is going to be a problem with deals pretty much exclusively with white wine. Sometimes with rosé. But you don't want your juice to be perfectly clear for your fermentation. When I was working for Domaine Chandon, we wanted our first fermentation of the base wine to be at about 2% solids. Most of the wineries that I deal with, like we're out, do it about 1% solids. And because that little bit of turbidity, that's what the yeast clings to. It helps it stay in suspension and helps with the fermentation. And it, sometimes what you see, if it's too highly clarified, that the yeast is going to struggle more to stay in suspension and will start to give off some uh, VA. And so you'll start to see elevated levels of acetic acid. So sometimes, now sometimes you do have to clarify your juice. If the, your grapes are in really nasty shape, if they've been, been infected, first thing you want to do is separate them from the solids. So you're going to press them off right away. So you're not going to do, ideally, if the grapes are in really bad shape, this goes straight to press, separate the juice from as many of the solids as you can right away. Then, Probably what you want to do is settle it, uh, aid it with, with uh, fining agents to get it so fast. As you want the least amount of time possible with the infected uh, material there. You find it, you get rid of that, you clarify your juice. Now what you do instead of having what's the natural clouding agents, you know, bits of the grape and stuff like that, now what you do is you can add back maybe some inactivated yeast. Your uh, complete nutrient will help you get more, uh, because it will have some of this uh, yeast solids in there, will help you get more turbidity. And then if you still want to get a bit more, you can get some cellulose powder, which is sterile, and th uh, throw some cellulose powder in there too. Just to give the yeast something to hold on to. Then the final thing, pesticide residue. Uh, I don't see this as much because most people are, are pretty good with pesticides. Although I have seen problems where people have been getting juice in from California and it has not been a really good year out there. I saw, uh, had some friends in Missouri that brought in some juice from California and they had to be used to it, not even the hit of a bubble. The yeast just died. This was a 2011. 2011. We had rain. It was more like weather in the Midwest. We had rain all through the growing season. I mean, we don't know how to deal with it in California. Uh, we had people that had bad botrytis infections. Their bricks was up to 22. And people tried to tell them, pick it, pick it, the grapes taste good. Your 22 bricks will still give you 13% alcohol. Hey, no, 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 I think we can wait it out. We're going to get it up to 25. And they ended up just with a rotten mass of grapes. Once you see botrytis, some people consider it already too late. Uh, anyway, uh, look out for pesticide rhythm. Remember, most pesticides are fungicides because the fungus is the biggest problem with grapes. Yeast is in the same family as fungus. So it makes sense if people are not paying attention to you know, how to spray, how much lead time before you pick your grapes, you're going to get residual in there, and that residual can kill the yeast. So, final thing here, and then, very last thing, general recommendation. And this is, was proven to be by a uh, winery in uh, North Carolina that thought they could save money by buying one brick of yeast, inoculating the first tank. And from that tank, they inoculated the second tank. From that tank, they inoculated the third tank. Remember what I told you about survival factors. 
Every time the yeast divides, you have half of the survival factors of each yeast cell. Well, by the time you get, when you do a serial inoculation like that, by the time you get to the fifth iteration, there are no survival factors left. And every year they call up and say, your yeast is no good. We've got to stop fermentation. And then we go out and find out it's their fifth fermentation or their fifth tank that was always sticky. Just because they wanted to save a few cents. So don't do cereal fermentations. That's the take-home message from that. Anyway, any questions? In that case, thank you all for coming. And uh, do you have a question? Yeah, just one more. I, I, I make a blueberry. And, you know, it's got, I guess, sulfur and derivatives in it. Good. So it's hard. It's hard for me to finish off the zero. Sometimes it does good, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know what the hell the problem is other than their blueberries. Well, uh, one thing, almost any fruit other than grapes generally are going to have a low nutrient status. Um, do you, have you ever tested your nutrient status on your blueberries? No, but I, I, I treat it the same, though. I, I do add nutrients to it. Yeah, so generally speaking, when I work with fruit, if I, because I'm, I'm going to take the assumption that that, that fruit is going to be have low nutrient status, my, my recipe, if I don't have the means of testing my, uh, 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 my juice for the yam, I do 40 grams per hectoliter, which is 400 parts per million of uh, organic nutrient, uh, which for me is the tomato. After, well, I start out with the rehydration nutrient, the rehydrate the yeast. After the lag phase for the yeast, when it's, actually, when it's actually starting to, to ferment, then I add the 40 grams per hectoliter, or 40 quarter parts per million, of the uh, organic fermento. And then after a third of the fermentation, I add 25 grams per hectoliter, which is 250 parts per million, of the, the fermented K, because that would be a slightly different mix, so it will just help to add to the general diversity of the nutrients. And doing that, I actually never had a problem. So you, you might try that and see how that goes. Uh, and then uh, also, what, what kind of temperatures are you fermenting at? Um, when I do the blueberries, it's about 75. Okay, yeah, that should be perfect then. So, yeah, the blueberries, actually blueberries will give you a wine that's the closest to a grape wine of, uh, of any fruit. The, uh, it's, uh, I actually, in the class that I was teaching at Napa College, on the Anything Goes class one time, I poured them, my students blind, now these are all wine makers, right? I poured them blind, the blueberry wine, from East Texas. And it was made dry, and, uh, they're all serious, and I remember they've been through 18 weeks now with the class, and so they have been like, mmm, yeah, I smell blueberries. Mm. It's Syrah, isn't it? No? Mmm, 